I'm interested in how uh, racial identity, specifically Blackness, gets enacted in digital spaces. In distributive Blackness, I argue that Blackness can be understood as an informational identity, one that's expressed through semiotic and material relationships between content, hardware, code, performances, and cultural phenomena. And by this, I mean that digital identity, even in our current multi-mediated TikTok era, is still largely a textual enactment of self. Unlike our physical selves, which are limited to one material space at a time, uh, online identities can exist in multiple places at once, although not always in the same context or enactment. And so if you think about it in the multiple spaces that you occupy as a social media user, whatever your racial identity may be, parts, bits and pieces of you are present in each space you occupy, whether that's LinkedIn, whether that's your group chat, whether that's Twitter, which is where I live, right? Or other spaces, parts of you are inhabiting each of those spaces. So you can distribute your informational body across multiple spaces, which is one of the benefits of the digital. Even more, once you do that digital practice, of publishing yourself to whatever online space you prefer, your self becomes available as an archive. Overall, I argue that people use technologies to reproduce themselves in whatever configuration the technology allows. And I think this is actually really important to understand as a gamer, right? In part because gaming identity is still an interestingly gendered and fraught category, right? And so this has become really important to me because if you don't identify yourself as a gamer, or if you do identify yourself as a gamer, what signs do you look for in the media that you love to interact with? And I agree that many male gamers believe that gaming is a masculine activity. And I've gone so far in my work um, to argue that the default digital identity of which video games is a part is white, male, masculine, heterosexual, or in some cases, hypersexual, and middle class. Today, I want to ask a little bit more, like in what other ways can we see this particular archetype work in video games? Uh, video games have long had a whiteness, uh, I'm gonna call it a problem, right? If you're a black gamer looking to be rep represented as a video game protagonist, you're pretty much out of luck. Multiplayer online battle arenas, MOBAs, and battle royales feature fairly diverse casts of heroes and heroines. Their characterization is largely presented as lore. In other words, their backgrounds, their histories, their motivations are largely absent because all you're really there to do is treat them as action figures. You inhabit their bodies with whatever skills they possess, and you take on your opponents who are also being inhabited by other players. From that perspective, you don't necessarily need to know that much about the character. Right. I will say you can play as ethnic characters in the games, but uh, the game I uh, was thinking of as I wrote this was a game called Apex Legends, right? And they have characters such as hmm, Bangalore, uh, Gibraltar, or uh, at least one that's not tied to a minoritized location, Seer, right? Uh, all of whom are brown skinned, right? But you will not be able to apprehend how their racial or ethnic identity informed the character. And this is a relatively new trend, but for years, gamers have complained that when minorities are placed into games where you can play multiplayer, in many cases, they were presented as reskinned versions of white characters. So their features wouldn't change, their mannerisms wouldn't change, their voices wouldn't change, but they'd be brown instead of white. I should at this point give a shout out to a developer slash designer uh, who I know as A.M. Dark. I don't really know her real name, but she is, they are uh, quite notable and have received awards because one of the things they began doing is they tried to interrogate what it meant to be black in video games was create a library of African, African oriented hair textures, right? So as a black gamer, um, one of the most difficult things you have to deal with when attempting to recreate yourself in digital form is the fact that the hair stars are terrible. Um, you might get uh, fuzzy cornrows. Uh, you might get a bad afro that doesn't move. It's completely uh, motionless. It's like you have a black basketball on your head, right? And what AM did was create uh, tools for developers to recreate the kinkiness, the coil, 
the texture and importantly the movement of black and brown hair in these video games it's fantastic work if i was smart i'd put her link on the website right but there is there are increasing possibilities to be uh the person of color that you envision yourself as offline in these online spaces One of the signs that you give off, or at least in your social media life, is sound. Sometimes that's your Spotify playlist, sometimes that's the audio to your video, but also think about it in terms of the recent rise of uh, voice chat apps, such as Clubhouse or Twitter Spaces or whatever Facebook called it, right? Many of which are centered around uh, virtual settings where people talk at and over one another over and over again. Researchers have long been interested in understanding whether listen, listeners can determine another person's race just by hearing them talk. And it turns out, in particular, because Americans are overstudied and overgeneralized as a research population, that Americans are really good at determining if a caller is a Black man or Black woman, right? And many of these researchers have found that being able to determine whether a person occupies a particular racial identity has attendant possibilities for racial discrimination. And I know this happens in Canada too, but we're just gonna talk about America. This becomes interesting in voice though, because gamers know this already. How many folk on the, on the call or in the Zoom use voice chat while playing multiplayer with randoms? And so Kishana Gray found that many of the black and queer women gamers that she studied actually turn voice chat off or use mods to alter the, the pitch of their voice because it turns out that men can be really nasty towards minorities in multiplayer games. Remember I talked about earlier how uh, sound is a major part of understanding a person's identity? So on the right side of the screen, I also have Nadine Ross on the top right. And then I have in a not that bright picture, which I probably could have brightened for you, right? Uh, Chloe Frazier. And you'll notice their voice actresses look a little different. And a huge controversy, particularly around these actresses, these voice actresses arose when the game Lost Legacy was released. But as you can tell, neither of them matched the ethnic uh, or racial identity of uh, the characters they portray on screen. One of my favorite people, Lauren Jackson of the North Western, in a different context, would we'll call this digital blackface. I will simply say uh, that colorblind casting introduces some problematics and being able to fully connect with the character's representation on screen. This game came out in 2017, but I actually was finally able to connect with a video game character in 2005. So you may be familiar with this hunched over man and the image I have on screen. In 2005, Sony Santa Monica introduced the Spartan warrior uh, Kratos uh, as the lead character in their new intellectual property, God of War. Right, and, and maybe some of you are familiar with this character, right? Um, he is distinguished by his uh, deep voice, his brutality, and his anger. They're the hallmarks of his ethnic and gender identity, right? Now, you may notice that Kratos 1.0 and 2.0 are pale as fuck. And even with their Greek origins, there's no real reason to suspect right, that their voice actor wouldn't be white as well. So I was hugely surprised to learn that an actor from one of my favorite shows, Living Single, uh, was the voice actor for Kratos 1.0. And another favorite, Christopher Judge from Stargate, was the voice actor for 2.0, right? And both men have really deep, resonant voices, uh, even though most of their voice acting is roars, grunts, screams, yells, uh, and for the 2018 version of Kratos, a lot of repetitions of the word boy. It was immediately clear to me, again, I'm an American and I'm really good at the whole detecting race thing, I think, um, that these voice actors were black. And so I began to think, what does it mean that this hyper-violent character with daddy issues, right, um, is one, so popular, but two, does their blackness of the voice actors have anything to do with understanding how violent he is? And in comparison, I could talk about going back to the Uncharted series, uh, both Nolan North, who plays Drake, and Troy Baker, who is another uh, hugely uh, uh, visible voice actor, plays Drake's brother, Sam, right? Nathan Drake's brother, Sam, uh, have been cast in tons of games as the leading voice actor, right? And if you saw them on the street, you probably wouldn't recognize them unless you go to cons. 
right? So there's no reason why those actors could not have been chosen for this particular voice role, the lead voice of a new IP. But there's something to be said for why this blackness, these black voices were chosen for us, right? And some of it is, I would argue, again, the hyper-masculinity of Kratos, And so how do I understand then the first Kratos as technically a criminal, right? He's doing crimes against God, uh, gods. And the second Kratos as a very distant, I would argue, maybe even deadbeat dad who has returned to raise his child after his wife has passed, right? It's very easy to throw them into stereotypes of black deviance and pathology. But what I found as I began studying him is that stereotypes are complicated. In a book called, um, communicating masculinity, Ronald Jackson writes that uh, throughout the literature on black masculinity, many of which were written by black feminists, right? There are five sensitizing constructs that reappear through this literature and they're indicative of black masculine positionality, uh, struggle, community, achievement, independence, and recognition. Now, Kratos gives not a damn about community. And his achievement is either the satisfaction of his vendetta or the protection of his son. But struggle, independence, and recognition are all arm marks that we can assign to Kratos' journey through these eight games, right? And offer an additional perspective on understanding how Blackness can then be reinterpreted as not necessarily a default identity, but a state of being. Right, which I think is actually a much more uh, valuable way to understand not just black masculinity, but masculinity in, gen in general. That masculinity is a process, right? Not necessarily a series of traits. Uh, there's something to be said in these last two games, particularly of the journey that Kratos also undergoes as he seeks to first enter the white ashes of his dead wife, and then uh, try to settle his score with the Greek, the Norse pantheon, where he builds a relationship with his son. Uh, studio, Sony Santa Monica, has done, I would argue, fantastic work in rebooting Kratos, not only as a grizzled older man, but in showing his journey from a man who doesn't really understand how to raise a child he's been left with, to building a growing uh, bonds of intimacy and familiarity and helping gamers understand his protectiveness towards this particular child, right? He's never not rough. He's never not difficult with other people. He actually hates helping other people, but he will go to whatever length is necessary in order to protect his child. And that is a depiction of black masculinity that you rarely get to see on any screen, whether the one in your hand, the one in your living room, or the one that these video game consoles and PCs put up. But thanks for inviting me. And thanks y'all for hanging out with me for so long.